like to thank you all for coming. I saw that there were over 100 people registered to come to this seminar today, which is really great. That really shows that there is an interest in this topic. And I really appreciate that you're taking this Thursday afternoon to spend it with us. And so I will present the results of a research project that we've been conducting for the last three years. And we've conducted um, fieldwork research here in Oslo and also in Kongsberg and Stavanger for the last three years. And actually, some of you in this audience have been informants for this project. And I really appreciate that you gave us that time and that you made this project possible. And uh, let's see, this is the one, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and so I will um, talk about international talent recruitment to Norway and particularly focus on the experiences of the skilled migrants that are here in Norway. And first I would like to acknowledge my co-author, Matt Cook. He is a graduate student at the University of Tennessee and he was in charge of coding and analyzing the survey that is included in the report and he also conducted background research for the project. So first, when we talk about international talent recruitment, we should talk about the global competition for talent. And there's a competition for talent between companies, between cities, even between countries. And this competition is likely to increase in the near future and when we have aging populations, when we have declining populations. And so this increase in competition has given rise to terms like the global war on talent. And so the global war on talent signifies that this is a real competition that is happening <coughs> right now. And so there are these companies that want to get these best and brightest workers and that are competing with each other. And so what is it that drives this demand for skilled migrants? Why is there this global war on talent? And so one of those reasons is that we are now in a global knowledge economy. So we have knowledge intensive industries that need these highly skilled workers. And we also have an aging workforce. So we have people that are retiring and that are not being replaced enough by young people who choose certain occupations that we now have shortages in. So where we have especially a need for skilled migrants and skilled workers in general is in engineering, in healthcare, and the information technology sector. And then we can ask, why do companies hire from abroad? Why don't they just hire here? And one of those reasons, especially in engineering and information technology, is because young people do not choose enough to go into the STEM disciplines in higher education. So STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's where we have those shortages. And there are good uh, initiatives here in Norway um, to try to recruit more students to those disciplines, but there's still not enough um, to fill those shortages. So what I will do today is I will shortly discuss the employer perspective. So how do employers recruit the workers that they need? Then the migrant perspective, and I will particularly talk about the institutional and personal opportunities and challenges of these migrants. And then shortly talk about a few integration initiatives. So what are companies and some private organizations doing to welcome and to help integrate these migrants. And then I will shortly talk about some of our contributions to the skilled migration debates. So when I talk about skilled migrants, I should also define what I mean by that. And those are highly skilled workers who possess a tertiary education or the equivalent in experience. So those are migrants who have a university degree or the equivalence. And the equivalence is important because in our study, we also focus on IT specialists, and some of those have a high school degree, but they definitely have skills that are equivalent to a university education. So I shortly want to talk about the skilled migration literature and what the literature has told us about the experiences of skilled migrants. So first of all, a large body of literature focuses on global cities. And these are cities that are financial nodes in the world economy. That is where you have well-known companies and that's where you have a lot of services. And so those are the cities where it is easy to attract migrants. Migrants go where those jobs are and where those companies are. So cities like New York or London, 
they have very little uh, effort to do to try to attract those migrants. They will come. Oslo, Stavanger, and Kongsberg have to maybe work a little bit harder to try to attract those migrants. Then the second point is the research on the elite skilled migrants. So the elite skilled migrants, those are the high value migrants who get the great relocation packages, who are experts for maybe one or two years, work in another city, and then move on to another city or move back home. So those are the highly mobile migrants who have privileged lives. But that is actually a very small proportion of all the skilled migrants. And so more recently, migration scholars have said, well, we shouldn't just focus on those elite migrants, but we really should also better understand those other skilled migrants. So that's where uh, Conradson and Latham, they coined the term middling skilled migrants. So those are the middle class skilled migrants. Those are not those privileged elite migrants, but those are the migrants that have skills that are in high demand and that have more middle class lives. And that is also what my study focuses on. And then Smith and Fafel published a book in 2006 called The Human Face of Global Mobility. And so they said, well, most of the studies have focused on the international level of where do the migrants come from, where do the migrants go to, but we're kind of missing the human face. We're kind of missing the migrants. We don't really know much about the migrants themselves. And so that is also what our report is trying to do, to give a human face to skilled migration, to give some insights into those lived experiences of the migrants themselves. So the four research questions that we address in our report are first of all, how do human resource managers, recruitment agents and private agents attract the skilled migrants that they need to Norway? Then why do these migrants decide to move to Norway? What institutional and personal opportunities and challenges do skilled migrants experience once they are in Norway? And what initiatives have been developed to welcome these migrants and also to retain them? And in addition, what could be done to maybe improve some of these services for the skilled migrants? So our report focuses on two groups of migrants, IT specialists and engineers in the oil and gas industry. And there are several reasons why we chose those groups of migrants. First of all, because both of those groups are, uh, use English as the main language. Um, and we only chose uh, companies where English is the business language. And also in terms of transfer of qualifications, if you are an engineer or an IT specialist, usually it is quite easy to transfer those skills. As Anna Meta mentioned earlier, I studied Polish nurses before, for nurses and other healthcare workers or also legal professionals, it's much more difficult to transfer those qualifications. In addition, IT specialists and engineers contribute to technology development and innovation. And in a global knowledge economy, if you want to be competitive, those are very valuable workers that you want to attract. And in, when we look at the labor shortages in Norway, IT specialists and engineers are some of those um, uh, professions that are in demand. So in terms of methods, I was here at FAFO for three summers in 2011, 2012, and 2013, and also some of my students, which I will show you later in the presentation. And we conducted a total of 128 interviews in those three summers. And we also conducted a survey in two IT companies and two oil and gas companies. And we conducted participant observation. We participated in events for immigrant organizations. And we also conducted observations during the visits to the companies when we uh, conducted the interviews. So let's start with the recruitment. How do HR managers find the employees that they need? And the report goes into more detail in this, but I do want to mention that social media are becoming increasingly important in reaching potential employees. And especially LinkedIn is a key tool that HR managers use. And um, some of the uh, informants in our study were actually located through LinkedIn. Employers actually found them and said you should apply for this job. 
So social media are a key part of the recruitment. Then the question of why do skilled migrants move to Norway? And of course, this is a complex issue. People usually don't just move for one reason. It's usually a composite of different reasons. But professional opportunities is one of the key reasons why skilled migrants move. And that is not just a finding in our study, that is also seen in other countries. But skilled migrants, they want professional challenges. They want to work with leaders in the field. They want to get more responsibility in their jobs. They want to work for well-known companies. So professional opportunities are definitely one of the top reasons why skilled migrants come. And as a geographer, I always like to think that place matters, that this is at the core of our discipline. We, we study the meanings of place. We, we always say place matters. But actually, what we found is that a lot of migrants who come, they come for the job. They don't necessarily come for Oslo or Kongsberg or Stavanger. That becomes much more important later on. If you talk in terms of retention, when migrants decide if they want to stay in Norway, place becomes very important. Another finding that we had was that some informants chose to apply for jobs in Norway in English-speaking companies to improve their English. Not to learn Norwegian, <laughs> but they wanted to get better at using English on the job. And so working in an English-speaking company was uh, an asset. That was one of the reasons they applied. And then the adventure and the exoticism. You know, some, uh, some informants didn't know that much about Norway or about Oslo, but they just wanted to try something new. And they decided to go to a country that they didn't know that much about. Now let's go on to the institutional and personal challenges that migrants experience. And when I have this list up here, I think most of you in this room already know about these issues. The media pays some attention to this. These are usually well-known issues. And the response time of the uh, Directorate of Immigration, it has de decreased, so the response time is better, but some people still have to wait uh, wait a while for their work permit and especially also for family permits. The other issue is the personal number or the social security number that sometimes people have to wait a long time for. And if you don't have that number, you cannot open a bank account, you cannot get a cell phone, you cannot get cable TV, you pretty much cannot start your life in Norway. And there are also some issues reported with the tax system some of the migrants have difficulties filing their taxes or also getting tax returns. And then the driver's license, I think the media has paid quite a bit of attention to that, that especially those who come from outside the European economic area, that they sometimes have to retake the whole um, the driving license training before they can drive here in Norway. And then the last point is only based on three informants. So I have to do more research on this. But three informants told me that they have to make a down payment of 25% of the total purchasing price before the bank will give them a loan. And they said that for ethnic Norwegians, that was 10%. And so based on three people, I need to do more research on this. But what I can say now is that if you have to put 25% down and you come here as a migrant, that is a very large sum. And for a lot of people, that is not uh, obtainable and they need to wait a long time till they can do that. Then the personal opportunities. This list probably also looks very familiar. I think everybody knows that there is a good quality of life or maybe even great quality of life here in Norway, right? Norway scores very high on the United Nations Human Development Index. There is also a good work-life balance. In general, people like the work environment that they're in. And the last point I want to spend a little bit more time on because most of the people that first move here, nature may not be that important to them. But in the long term, when I ask them if they decide to stay in Norway or what is it that they appreciate of living in Norway, and the access to nature and participating in the outdoors becomes very important to most of our informants. And then some personal challenges. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is, I never asked, so what do you think about the Norwegian weather? No. I asked, tell me what it's like to live and work in Norway. And one of the first things was like, well, 
It's rainy, it's cold, it's dark. <laughs> so for some people, this is something that they cannot overcome. For some migrants, this is just an issue that is one of the reasons why they return. Or if spouses don't like it. You know, the, the key informant in our study might really like the job and might be able to deal with it. But if the spouse doesn't like it, you can have the best HR manager, you can have the most wonderful company to work for, but the weather you just can't change. The second point is language proficiency. And we could have written a whole report just on language because it is a very important issue. What I do want to say specifically from our study is that all of the uh, companies in our study have English as their working language. But at the same time, some of those companies actually require of some of their employees to learn Norwegian within two years, especially if they have a lot of contact with Norwegian clients. And sometimes migrants themselves, especially if they are part of a team of other Norwegians, they feel that it is necessary to learn Norwegian because every time they walk in the room, they have to the others have to switch to English or um, they hear a joke and they don't really know what that is about. And of course, also when people have children in schools and the children start to learn Norwegian, then they really want to know what their children are talking about. So most of the time, um, immigrants do want to learn the language. And some companies have really understood that this is very important. So some companies even offer language courses in-house. So they bring in a teacher who um, provides language lessons or they reimburse the migrants when they have finished the language course. So in that sense, the companies communicate to the employees that they really value that. And of course, for long-term retention, it's very important that people do speak the language. And then, as a geographer, as I said, I'm very interested in the meanings of place. And so where a company is located also really affects people's sense of belonging and people's sense of the connection to the place that they live in. And of course, it's very different from a migrant to live in Oslo than to live in Kongsberg or in Stavanger. And I go more into detail in the report about that, but the companies that are there, and maybe Jörn can speak more to that after the break, they're very aware of that. And they, they really try to make it more attractive by um, more sports facilities, more social events. Um, but it is something to keep in mind because especially when you attract young people, whether they're single or they're young with families, they have certain needs. They want certain social activities. And then we all know that there is a tight housing market in all Norwegian cities. And so when migrants first arrive, and if they do not get assistance from the company to find housing, that can be a really stressful time because they're already they're in a new environment, starting a new job, and then they have to go find housing that is very difficult to find. So some companies actually um, purchase apartments and rent those out to their employees, which is really, uh, really helpful. Um, but if companies cannot do that, if they can at least assist in finding housing, that is, uh, that is really key. And then the establishment cost. So when migrants first move here, they often have to pay three months of rent in advance. And they have to pay uh, for local transportation, for food. So, and especially if they don't get paid for the first two months, that is a really big sum to put up front. And so that is something else to keep in mind that um, that is another big stress factor for newcomers when they come here. And then the last part, is that, of course, this depends on people's personality. Some people are very outgoing, they make friends easily, but we also have some examples of social isolation. We have some examples of informants who feel that it is very difficult to get to know Norwegians, both on the job and outside the job, and of course, language has something to do with that too. Um, but that is also where companies can make an effort to organize social events so that at least the migrants have a social network at work. And some of the companies in our study are very good at that. And some companies just leave it up to the migrants and say, you know, you're here now, here's your job, <laughs> and uh, you can go from there. So some of those company initiatives, when I mentioned earlier, when I asked people, tell me about your experiences of living and working in Norway, the weather was one of the key things that came up. The other one was food. And most people were not that excited about Norwegian food. 
So companies have understood that. And so they offer hot lunches. And they offer usually three different courses to choose from uh, that appeal to different taste buds. And that is what employees really appreciate. The other one is social programs. So there are some companies that are very good at providing social programs that help migrants establish a social network at work, both with other foreign-born and also with ethnic Norwegians. The other important role is played by immigrant organizations. So when migrants become members of immigrant organizations, that is a key site for uh, developing a social network. And interestingly, those immigrant organizations also provide very useful information about living and working in Norway. So for example, they offer workshops about how to purchase a home in Norway, um, about Norwegian labor regulations, the duties and rights of employees here in Norway. Um, they also even provide workshops on how to become friends with Norwegians. So those kinds of um, helpful workshops really help migrants better understand Norwegian society and also helps them establish these social networks. And then of course hobbies. Hobbies are a great way to create social, uh, social networks. And it is of course important that migrants don't just develop those networks at work, but that they also develop relationships outside of work. And some of those hobbies actually bring employees together outside of the work environment. And so here I just have a few examples. So sports activities are very, um, uh, very common. And also uh, friends and colleagues might go out for, uh, for some food or for some drinks. Of course, they can go to concerts. Salsa dancing is very popular, especially among IT specialists. I'm not really sure why. <laughs> and then um, here we also have colleagues that uh, train together for large sporting events. So for example, to participate in the Birkebeiner ski race or in the Holman Kollen relay race. So these are some of the key activities that bring the migrants together. So now I want to move on to another part of the project, which is about skills and networks. So what we did in this study, when I mentioned we interviewed 128 people, part of those were migrants and part of those are stakeholders in skilled migration. Because I really wanted to understand better how the skilled migration process operates and how these stakeholders help shape the skilled migration process. And so as geographers, we think in terms of skill, which is a vertical way of thinking where social activities take place and where social processes take place. So that is a vertical way of thinking. And then horizontally, you can look at networks between people. And so as geographers, we have often said that we want to integrate this perspective on skill and networks, this vertical and horizontal way of thinking and this is one of the parts of the project that I'm trying to do, to think more theoretically through these skills and networks. So this is what that looks like. So this is our skill and network map. And the colored pieces of paper, those are the different stakeholders that are involved in skilled migration. And then we place those on the map based on at what scale they operate the most. So we can operate at the local scale, the national scale or the international scale. And then with those strings of yarn, we connected those stakeholders to uh, show where those networks are located. And so the more strings that go to one stakeholder, the thicker that push pin gets, right? At some point you can't put any more on it. And that's where you see a key node. That's where you see a stakeholder who plays a very important role in the skilled migration process. So I'll give you two examples from our study of two of those key stakeholders that got a lot of those networks coming together and that work on different skills. And so the first one is EURES. And EURES is Europe European Employment Services. And EURES is part of an EU effort to increase labor mobility within the European Union or the European Economic Area, I should say, because we know that Europeans don't move that much. They don't move much across international borders. And so EURES has offices, local offices, national and international offices. 
and they have a lot of knowledge about the European labor market. They know where the labor needs are and they know where the job seekers are. So EURES is a key bridge of information between those foreign born job seekers and the HR managers that want to hire them. So they both provide the HR managers uh, information about where those job seekers are and also they provide cultural information which is very important. So they will say something about the educational system, they will say something about the culture, so what can you expect in those job interviews and then they bring together those job seekers and the HR managers. So that is one example of a key, sorry, a key stakeholder that brings together other stakeholders. And then another example is the Oslo Global Mobility Forum. And I was there yesterday and the day before yesterday. And interestingly, the Mobility Forum brings together a lot of the stakeholders that we have on our skill and network map. And that is not so strange because that's exactly what the, the conference wants to do. So they bring together these different stakeholders to discuss issues in skilled migration, to share best practices, and to set an agenda for skilled migration for the near future. So here I just put a few of those stakeholders that are involved in the mobility forum. So the city of Oslo was there, government representatives, the University of Oslo was there, and high school in Oslo Akershus, um, industry representatives, so lots of companies were there, and also some migrants were involved in that. So again, this is one of those stakeholders that brings together other stakeholders <coughs> to discuss skilled migration issues and to also specifically discuss how can we make Oslo a more attractive city for migrants and how can we attract more skilled workers to the Oslo region. So here I just put a few information providers in Oslo that are on that skill and network map. And these organizations all want to provide information to foreign-born skilled workers. And at this point, when we looked at the skill and network map, they were not that much connected. So the, the networks passed those different stakeholders. And so that is one of the ways that you can look at this and say, all of these organizations have a very good sense of skilled migration. They know what the needs of the migrants are, they know how to provide that information, but that maybe more collaboration between those stakeholders could scale up these efforts, could scale it up maybe to the city level or even the national level. And then I want to talk a little bit about debates on skilled migration. And when I go to these conferences like the Oslo Global Mobility Forum and some other conferences I attended here in Oslo on skilled migration, there's a lot of focus on recruitment. There's a lot of focus on how do we attract these best and brightest workers? How can we make Oslo more attractive to foreign talent? And of course, those debates are very important and I'm very happy that they are taking place. But I think we sometimes lose a little focus on retention. And I think that that is a very important aspect as well, because companies put a lot of time and effort into attracting those <coughs> workers here, but we should focus more on those who already are here, identify what their needs are, and try to meet those needs. The second, I think that we know a lot about those institutional challenges. I think that one slide that I put up there earlier wasn't much of a surprise. But I don't think we know that much about the personal challenges. And I think that is something we should focus more on, again, if you want to retain those workers. And also, those workers are ambassadors for your companies, right? They are the ones who tell their friends, their colleagues, and say, you know, there's a job opening, you should apply for that. And of course, from the migrant perspective themselves, if we can make their lives better, I think that would be a good thing. And then the last part is migration regulations, because right now Norway is doing really well. The Norwegian economy is doing much better than economies in many other countries, and that is part of the reason why migrants come here. The oil and gas industry is also booming, so you need a lot of migrants. But maybe a few years from now, when other economies are recovering, 
and maybe if some other economic factors change, maybe it's not that easy to attract migrants anymore. So I think we should focus more on migration regulations and ask more of a question, so where do we go from here? Maybe three or five years from now, what are uh, some of the regulations we should start thinking about? And then I have three suggestions for future research. And one of them is that in our study we found that recruitment agencies, private agents and consultancy firms play a key role, especially in the oil and gas industry. And we already have a literature on this, but I think it would be really good to better understand the recruitment channels that these uh, agencies use to attract these skilled migrants. Then the second, as a geographer, I really think it would be good to know more about those meanings of place in the local incorporation of skilled migrants. So in what ways is Oslo specific for attracting skilled migrants? What is it in Kongsberg or Stavanger or any other Norwegian cities that attracts these migrants? And how does that environment then help with the local incorporation or maybe doesn't? And then the third one, and I think this is a very important one. So we collected a lot of data in these last three years. We have a very good sense of the stakeholders that are involved in skilled migration. We have 128 interviews. Most of those are transcribed. We collected a lot of secondary data. We have newspaper articles. We have reports. We have articles on skilled migration. And this is a moment in time. So what our report shows now is what skilled migration is like, especially under the global financial crisis, because that was the background in which this migration happened. But three or five years from now, that can be quite different. And also, if you can follow those migrants over time, if you can do a longitudinal study and see who is still here three years from now, or maybe who has changed jobs, or how has a change in their family situation or change in other situations, change their perspectives and their experiences. And I think that is very valuable because that way we can better understand the, the lives of the migrants and we can also make more <coughs> informed policy decisions. And then, of course, I want to thank my research assistants. Here we have eight students that have participated in the project so far, and five of these eight have been right here in Oslo, had desks here in Oslo, and participated in life here uh, at FAFO. And um, that was a really great experience for them, both to be part of a working environment at FAFO and to, to know better what that is like, and also to be part of the interviews, because they co-conducted the interviews, they participated in events of immigrant organizations, um, so that was very helpful for them. And then I want to let you know about our website, skilledmigration.net. And so that is where we post updates on our, um, on our project. And so uh, we have the research activities and we also have the student research on there. And we post um, reports on the research dissemination and at the end of January, there will be more research dissemination because two articles are still um, in the publication phase, but they should be ready by that time. So if you check back at skilledmigration.net, you can get updates on the project. And then I would like to thank our study participants and the study participants in this audience who have participated in this project. I'm really thankful for that. And uh, of course, uh, Lena Eldering, who has been a big part of this, who has provided feedback on the report and who has made it possible to publish this report and organize this seminar and finance part of this report, which is very important. <laughs> <laughs> and Anna Meta, of course, for leading this seminar and Tina Usberg for organizing this seminar that we're in today. And of course, the discussants who will provide their feedback in the second hour. I want to thank you for being here. And then Cecil Trugstad and her uh, group, research group, for giving me an academic home in the summers. And FAFO East Forum for making this seminar possible and for co-financing the report. And then the University of Tennessee financed part of the report. And the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for paying my travel here, that I can be here. And also, last but not least, the National Science Foundation that funded this project that made it all possible. So, thank you.